The prevalent, that is to say, the Darwinian model for evolution is natural selection. I'm going to state a different model. Evolution is adaptation informed by hereditary memory. What's the difference, you might ask? Well, one is primarily mechanical and law-driven, built around what I call object thinking. That's the Darwinian idea, focused on one model of hereditary memory, the gene. Genes are objects that are filtered through natural selection. And the story of evolution is the history of these objects through time. There's an alternative built around what I call process thinking. Adaptation is a process central to the nature of life itself. In the Darwinian idea, the process might be acknowledged, but it's ultimately regarded as a sideshow. Organisms where adaptation takes place are simply vehicles for the transmission of objects, genes from generation to generation. Organisms don't evolve, genes do. So far in this course, I've been building a process model for adaptation in organisms, one that's grounded in, in physical reality, but that recognizes the, the essential intentionality of the process of adaptation. What I want to do here is to extend that process thinking to lineages of organisms, to evolution in a word. To do so, we need to take a deeper look at hereditary memory, and there's much more to it than genes. Let me restate my operational definition of evolution. Evolution is adaptation informed by hereditary memory. And just what do we mean by those words, hereditary memory? I'll start by introducing you to my mother. This is her, holding me when I was about a year and a half old. We were living then in Borger, in the Texas Panhandle. If I resemble my mother, it's because I carry within me a memory of her. In other words, I've inherited something of what made my mother what who she was. In turn, if my daughter resembles me, it's because she carries within her a memory of me and, of course, a partial memory of her grandmother, my mother. Hereditary memory is a powerful shaper of lineages. And if we're going to understand evolution, it's vital that we understand what hereditary memory is. Since the concept of the gene began to emerge in the early 20th century, the tendency has been to conflate the gene with hereditary memory. Hereditary memory is genetic memory, and vice versa. But is there more to memory than that? I think so. And to convince you of this, we need to take a fundamental look at just what memory is. First, memories exist in a dimension of time. We usually think of memory as a remembrance of things past, a recall of the past. That is to say, memory looks backward in time. Fair enough, that's how we usually experience memory. But there's a related and counterintuitive thing to say about memory. Memory doesn't just recall the past, it anticipates the future. Okay, let's think of it in this way. Here's a timeline from the past at the bottom and rising into the future at the top. We're going to represent the environment as this blurry line, which represents its state. The blurriness represents disorder and randomness. The environment exists in time. It moves from past to future. Okay, let's reset and begin the journey again from past into future. In the absence of memory, there's no orderliness, no evolution, no indication of time's arrow, really. Nature in the future will look pretty much like nature in the past. Okay, let's reset again. But this time, let's suppose a memory is formed here, which we'll represent by this green hexagon. As we continue to follow its track forward through time, this memory ensures that the environment is reshaped, and there's now a time's arrow. 
At the time when the memory is formed, the present no longer looks like the past. And furthermore, the memory will bias the environment as it moves forward in time, so that the future now reflects the memory that was formed in the past. In short, the memory is an anticipation of the future. Here's the second important thing. I'll frame it as a question. Is memory an object or is it a process? From the very beginning of genetics, stretching back to Gregor Mendel, the implication has been that memory is an object, a thing, a particle of heredity. That kind of object thinking carried over into the molecular genetics that developed in the 1960s and 1970s. The particulate gene of Mendel was transformed into a nucleotide sequence code. The gene may not be a gem-like particle anymore, but it was still an object. The code was carried on a known chemical, a nucleic acid. But is the material gene the memory itself? I say, no, it's not. The code itself, or whatever material nature exists for heredity, is really not the memory itself. It's what we might call a memory token, an object. Just as you would feed a subway token into a process that ultimately gives you a subway ride, so too is a memory token fed into a process that ultimately gives you a memory. And the memory itself is not a material thing. It's the result of a process. It's a process memory. If evolution is adaptation informed by memory, what kinds of memory are we talking about? In the modern Darwinian idea, that memory is the object gene. Mendel's particles of heredity early on, something in the chromosomes later on. No matter what, Mendelian genes were passed generation to generation as atoms of heredity. Then, genes became specified sequences of nucleotide code. What enabled DNA to serve as hereditary memory was self-replication. And out of this came what has come to be known as the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma states that structure and function are related to heritable memory by a one-way path. Specifically, heritable memory, which resides in DNA sequence code, can be retrieved through copying that code onto another nucleic acid, RNA, which serves as a kind of scratch pad memory. This molecule of RNA contains the information needed to encode for specific proteins, which ultimately are the basis of both function and structure. The central dogma is obviously very strongly gene deterministic. The only way a new function could be brought about would be through changes ultimately in the DNA sequence code, which would ramify through to scratch bed memory and function. This was Morgan's mutationism. There's another important dogma that actually predated the central dogma by several decades. This was August Weismann's germline segregation dogma. We've already met August Weismann as the person who determined that heritable memory, whatever it was, had to be carried on the chromosomes. Weismann's germline is a lineage of cells that connects one generation to another. The germline is the lineage, in other words. Here's how that's supposed to work. Imagine you have a light-colored pigeon. The body of the pigeon is called the soma. That's the part that eats, flies around, mates, and so forth. The part that does what pigeons do. Contained within the soma is a separate lineage of cells separated away known as the germline. These are the cells that give rise to the gametes, the sperm, or the ova. If adaptation occurs in the soma, in this case, let's say the pigeon's plumage turns darker, the segregated germline states that the pigeon's adaptation will not be passed on to its offspring. And why? because the only connection between parent and offspring is through the segregated germline. 
The actual organisms are just vehicles for moving the germline from one generation to the next. If the germline of one generation specified light-colored plumage, the next generation will also be born with light-colored plumage. If the offspring developed dark plumage, it would have to do so on its own and not inherited from the adaptation of its parents. In other words, any adaptation that happened in the soma would die with the individual. The only way darker plumage could be transmitted to the offspring would be through some kind of a mutation or change in the cells of the segregated germline. Together, the central dogma of molecular biology and the germline segregation dogma form what we might call the central dogma of neo-Darwinism, to wit, evolution is gene selectionism. The logic behind this is quite simple, and it's compelling, but only if the premises are true. And to put it bluntly, these dogmas have not stood up well over the years. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but suffice it to say that our growing understanding of the gene, of hereditary memory, and of the translation of sequence code to function has completely undercut both the central dogma and the doctrine of germline segregation. Now, rather than DNA, RNA, and protein being organized into a linear one-way network, the three components look more to be organized into a fluid network, with each component influencing the other. DNA can determine RNA, and RNA can specify proteins, that's the central dogma, but the reverse is also true. RNA can edit DNA, or other RNAs, and proteins can act to modify both RNA and DNA. And finally, DNA, RNA, and proteins all interact with themselves. So complicated are these interactions that biologists have turned to a different way of organizing their thinking. So, for example, the whole range of interactions of RNA are lumped into a large realm known as the transcriptome. Proteins have their own realm of interaction, known as the proteome. And DNA now inhabits its own realm, the traditional genome. The genome and transcriptome overlap quite a bit, as do interactions between transcriptome and proteome, and between proteome and genome. And there is a realm where all three interact. There's more. The genome, transcriptome, and proteome all are enclosed within a cell membrane, and this comprises the cell's metabolome. As a way of conceptualizing the complicated relationships of all the cell's components, this omic approach is certainly an improvement over the central dogma, yet the approach is ultimately as reductive as the central dogma. If we understand the intricacies of how each of these black boxes work and how they interact, we'll understand life, right? Well, maybe not. The genome, transcriptome, proteome, and the metabolome all remain material clockworks. This research program is to work out the cogs and levers, and it's a fine goal as far as it goes, but we're still stuck with a kind of reductive gene determinism. The cogs and levers ultimately are determined by the genome. Yet the emerging picture of the gene coming from this omics approach is actually starting to look very fluid. We know, for example, that DNA can be modified through variations in the transcriptome and from variations in the proteome. Furthermore, these changes can be heritable. That is to say, these modifications can be replicated, carrying over into future generations of organisms. Now, the gene is no longer a specifier of function, as it is in the central dogma. Rather, it's a participant in function, fully in cahoots with all the other ohms. When we look outward now, we see that the cell membrane is actually an adaptive boundary. It also is a participant, fully in league with the other participants in this process. The metabolome, obviously, but also the proteome, transcriptome, and genome. And the environment in which it's embedded, 
the extended organism, in other words. What's most interesting here is that adaptive modification of the metabolome wrought by the adaptive boundary in response to a changed environment can also bring about heritable variations of the genome. In short, contrary to the twin dogmas of molecular biology and germline segregation, adaptive experience of the organism can feed back and modify the genome. This kind of modification of the genome in response to its environment is known as epigenetic modification. And this is the soft inheritance that Darwin sought, unsuccessfully, to incorporate into his thinking on evolution. Darwin might have been wrong on the details, but epigenetics has provided the means for a new perspective on the heritable memory of adaptation, all solidly grounded in science, by the way. So it's science that has killed neo-Darwinism. Epigenetics breaks the shackles of gene determinism. Together with the extended organism idea and the idea of process memory, this vastly expands, expands the range of what can serve as hereditary memory. And here's a hint, it's not just DNA anymore. Let's explore this question with the termite colonies I've already spoken about. The termite mound is more than a pile of soil glued together with termite spit. If you look inside, the mound houses an intricate network of tunnels. This tunnel network was revealed, by the way, by filling the mound tunnels with plaster of Paris and then carefully washing the soil away. The mound's internal tunnel network is what enables the mound to serve as an organ of physiology, namely as a wind-driven lung for the colony. They look remarkably like the network of airways within the lung. And in the mound, they work in the same way as they do in the lung. This makes the termite mound an adaptive boundary for the colony extended organism. The termites build the mound by moving sand and clay up from the underground colony and gluing it in place with saliva. This is quite a dynamic process. The termites collectively move about 250 kilograms of soil through the mound each year. This replaces the soil that erodes away each year from wind and rain. This flow of soil through the mound means that the mound is always being remodeled by the termites, just as bones are continually remodeled by osteocytes and osteoclasts. Like those bone cells, the termites are themselves extended organisms contained within their own adaptive boundaries and nested within the adaptive boundary of the mound. And there are about 2 million of these termite extended organisms in a colony. Termites are cognitive beings. They process various environmental, tactile, and chemical signals in their environment, which then control how the termites interact with the mound structure. Termites are such simple creatures that it is tempting to treat them as tiny robots with the operating system encoded in the termites genome. Thus, the architecture of the mound is specified by whatever is programmed in the genomic operating system. This is the mound as gene determinism. Treating the mound as an extended organism complicates this simple picture considerably. Whatever the termites do to the mound, this feeds back onto the environment contained within the mound adaptive boundary which affects the range of environmental, tactile, and chemical cues that are feeding back into the cognitive termite. This looks like a conventional negative feedback system, but the termite as cognitive being makes it more than just a simple machine. The operating system is prone to re-editing through effects on the epigenome. And this, in turn, reflects the termite's cognitive assessments of the environmental, tactile, and chemical cues it's always listening to. And these, in turn, are affected by the termite-constructed adaptive boundary of the mound. What seems to be in control here is not so much the termite's genome, but the termite's collective cognition. And this ultimately reflects the termite's desire to build an environment that's comfortable for them. 
Now, this is not to dismiss the importance of heritable memory at all. Rather, it leads to an expansion of the notion of heritable memory. There is certainly heritable memory that exists within the termite. This is very short-lived, however. The lifespan of a typical worker termite is on the order of three to four weeks. The lifespan of the colony, which essentially is the same as the lifespan of the mound, is much longer, on the order of about 20 years. So the mound can serve as a kind of heritable memory to subsequent generations of termites. Why? Because the adaptive boundary of the mound, constructed by one generation of termites, exists beyond that generation's lifespan. Thus, the mound is as much hereditary legacy to future generations of termites as the genes that are passed from generation to generation. In this instance, it's the hereditary memory embodied in the mound that is the most influential form of hereditary memory. So, where does all this leave the gene? The principal effect is to dethrone the gene as the primary or sole carrier of hereditary memory. It doesn't negate the gene, but it does force a change of perspective. Treating hereditary memory as a form of process memory, rather than as object memory, opens up the landscape to a broad scope of processes that can serve as hereditary memory. Now, the gene is one form of process memory that participates with innumerable other forms of process memory to form hereditary memory. And persistence of these various forms of memory is what determines the heritability. Specifically, memories that persist beyond the lifetimes of individuals are as much hereditary legacy as any gene. And needless to say, this changes our concept of hereditary memory considerably, and with it, our concept of evolutionary fitness. Now, fitness does not turn on simple measures of replicability, as it does if genes are the only form of hereditary memory. Rather, fitness turns on the persistence of a mix of different types of process memory. This also restores adaptation, not genes, as the central driver of evolution. Okay, let's now put all of this together into a coherent and non-Darwinian theory of evolution.